I had had the idea for a long time that I wanted to witness the crossroads of history. I found that often it was the people who were least free who had the deepest understanding of freedom. It was often people whose words were constrained who used their words most powerfully. It was often in the societies that looked from the outside as though they were closed down or disadvantaged that there was the greatest exuberance. I want people to come away from this book with a sense that the world is rich and full of possibilities and that what we think is only ours turns out actually to be shared by much of the world. I have visited 87 countries and written about many of them. I started off wanting to get over my fear of the world. I was kind of a frightened kid, and in some ways this book tells the story of how I gradually let go of all of that fear and took on board the idea that it was possible to go anywhere, to meet anyone, to look at almost anything. I started off writing about artists in Moscow and Leningrad at the end of the Soviet Union. I rode a reindeer in Mongolia. I went dog sledding with the Inuit in Greenland. I attempted to get to Antarctica on a dysfunctional icebreaker. When I was in Senegal, I actually was the subject of an undop, or a tribal exorcism, the Senegalese ritual for the treatment of mental illness. At the sort of key high point, I was pulled out of the makeshift wedding bed I was sharing with a ram in the center of the town square, yanked to my feet, my clothes were pulled off, and I was covered in the blood of the ram who had just been slaughtered. And I thought, this is a far cry from psychotherapy as it's practiced in New York. I was incredibly exhilarated by it. I remember it as a moment of extraordinary joy. I reported from Libya. Life under Gaddafi was much worse than anyone who wasn't there can say. There was enormous hope that when he fell, there would be something brave and just to come in his wake. And what has ensued instead is a terrifying chaos. I look at the ways in which those hopes were frustrated and I find nonetheless that the people I got to know remember that moment of hope and that it was transformative. It is something for them to hold on to. And often I think hope occurs repeatedly and change occurs after hope's multiple inceptions. It takes a great many failed moments of hope before the moment when that hope is actually realized. While I was working on this book, we entered the global world in which what happens everywhere affects what happens everywhere else. If your life is going to be changed by what happens in Moscow or Beijing or Lusaka, you need to know about and understand those places. So much of the time now, people seem to feel that they're caught in the crosswinds coming from places they don't know or understand. I hope this book will help them to know and understand those places better. We're all afraid that someone's going to come and blow up the place where we live and the place that we love. The basis of our having any feeling of security is interacting with the world. Over the course of the last few decades, I've gone to an awful lot of places. The reality often is that what people would most like is to understand you and to be understood by you. That humanity is full of a yearning for mutual seeing. I would like this book to open the hearts and minds of readers to a larger world and make them see that what they perceive to be threatening is actually in many instances joyful.